So last month, I had the opportunity to go on a silent retreat. So this is basically 30 days where my only responsibilities were prayer, rest, and recreation to experience a recreation. And so I went, of course, out into the middle of nowhere South Dakota, where the closest town was probably about 30 minutes away. And it was a bustling metropolis of about 400 people and a general store. <laughs> and as I was sharing my plans with the parishioners here prior to leaving, some of them expressed kind of a jealousy over all of this silence that I would get to, to experience during my time there. Now, of course, these people were, were all mothers of children who were home for this summer from, from school. But I would say a vast majority of the people said, oh, there's no way I could do that. There's no way that I could go that long without talking. Now, I must admit, I was a little bit hesitant about going at first as well. Not because I'm a huge fan of talking and I thought that I would miss it, but because I knew that spending that much time with somebody without any distractions, without any distractions at all, can become very intense, very quick. Prayer, very much like conversation, can only stay on the surface for so long until eventually you have to move just a little bit deeper, deeper into those recesses of the heart where things begin to perk, to, to perk up and to percolate into the surface. And so I knew that this would happen eventually. And I felt like it was something like uh, maybe when we're kids and we knew that our mom was going to come to check to see how clean our room is. And there's a little pinch of fear in our hearts because we know that all we did was shove everything into the closet and shut the door real quick before it had an opportunity to fall back on us. And our mom comes in and she, she looks around and everything looks you know, nice and neat at first, but eventually she's going to open the closet. And who knows what kind of mess is going to fall out at that point. Well, Jesus is kind of the same way. He has a tendency to love, to poke, and to prod at all those closed doors in our hearts, those doors that we would much rather see remain closed so that at least we can keep up the appearances that our life is nice and neat, that everything is tidy and in place. Today in our Feast of the Transfiguration, we read in the Gospel that Jesus takes Peter, James, and John apart. And they had a very, an encounter very much like I did on my retreat. He takes them to the top of the mountain and it is there that a glimmer of his glory is revealed to them. Now, even in this small little glimmer of his glory, it is still brighter than the sun. It is still whiter than light. But yet the important thing about this encounter is not the change that took place in Jesus, but rather it's the change that took place in the apostles. You see, for just a brief moment, the veil was pulled back, and they were able to see Jesus standing in his light, the light of his glory, and to behold Jesus as he truly was. And in that light, they were able to see themselves as they truly were. You see, because it's only Christ who reveals us to ourselves, who shows us who we were made to be. So often we reduce our identity to the work that we do, to the money that we have, to the clothes we wear, the people with whom we associate. But it is God alone who can give us our identity. It is God alone who calls us by name. You are my beloved son. You are my beloved daughter in whom I am well pleased. This proclamation is made at every one of our baptisms and it continues to echo throughout eternity. This is what Christ says to us. And he acts like a mirror to reveal to us the glory we were made to share, the divine life in which we were made to live. You see, the true glory of God is us fully alive, filled with his light, filled with his love, filled with his glory. But so often we shrink from this invitation. We shrink from this divine call because we are afraid of what it entails, afraid of what it might ask of us, afraid of what it might reveal in us. The challenge of the apostles back then, the challenge to us now, is to throw wide open those doors, allowing whatever mess is inside to spill out so that the light of God's glory can fill in. 
It is true that God loves us where we're at. But it is also true that, he's not, that he loves us so much that he doesn't want us to stay there. He is constantly inviting us deeper into himself, deeper into a more intimate relationship with him. Not for his good, but for ours. But so often we're, we're so busy running from one distraction to the next so that we can't hear his voice and we can't respond to his invitation. And when this happens, Jesus remains as just a historical figure. He remains as a good teacher or a moral guide, maybe a face that's painted in pictures or a name in a book. And as a result, we remain unchanged. We remain unfulfilled. Prior to going on this retreat, I felt like I had a pretty good relationship with Christ. I mean, after all, I I pray regularly, I go to Mass, I receive the sacraments. I mean, for goodness sakes, I've been studying to be a priest for the last five years. You'd think I would have established a relationship with the Lord by this time. But yet I realized on that retreat that I had not given God the proper opportunity. I had not given him permission. I had not given him the space to allow his glory to shine all around me, to fill me from within. Because I had been busy, busy about the things of the Lord, yes, but not being with the Lord, not allowing him to spend time. And this is not just so that I become a better priest. It's not even so that I become a better Christian, but it's so that I can become a better man, to become the best version that God has made me to be. It's not necessary that we we go out into the middle of nowhere, South Dakota, for 30 days in order to experience this encounter with the Lord. But it is necessary that we avail ourselves of the opportunities that are are present to us, even here. Maybe at the church, signing up for the long retreat or committing yourselves, ourselves, for an hour of adoration. Maybe it's in our own homes, taking a few minutes in the morning, a few minutes in the evening, perhaps delaying, reaching for the radio when we get in the car, just to allow a few moments of silence to enter into our lives so that the Lord can speak to us and we can speak to the Lord, that we can enter into a deeper communion with him, not just rattling off a a bunch of prayers that we memorized, not just giving the Lord a list of demands that we hope to be fulfilled, but allowing heart to speak to heart so that this intimacy with him can be fostered. He is a God that so longs for this intimacy, who is running after us at every moment, inviting us, tugging at our hearts, pulling us closer to himself, but yet we have to give him permission to do so. We have to surrender ourselves, allowing him to draw us into that glory for which we were made. And if we do this, it will change everything. But even more important than changing everything, it begins to change us.